The Death of Nero Suetonius reports Before his death, Nero was frightened by portents from dreams, auspices, and omens. He never used to have vivid dreams, but this changed after he had his mother, Agrippina, killed. In these dreams, Nero was at the helm of a great ship steering the vessel. Suddenly the tiller was wrenched from his hands, and he was dragged into the thickest darkness by his former wife, Octavia. There he was smothered and carried off by a swarm of winged insects. Suddenly he found himself surrounded by the statues of subject nations displayed in Pompey's theatre. Then his favourite horse, a Spanish steed, was transformed before his eyes. The hind parts of the horse morphed into an ape's rear end, and its unaltered head whinnied a tune. Then there were the omens. The doors of the imperial mausoleum flew open of their own accord, and a voice was heard coming from within, summoning Nero by name. The imperial lares, images of household gods, had been left unattended during the calends of January. Suddenly, they all fell to the ground during preparations for a sacrifice. As Nero was taking the auspices, Sporus gave him a gemstone ring engraved with the rape of Proserpina, who had been taken to the underworld. When the sacred pledges were to be made, a great multitude from all social orders assembled near the temple of Jupiter. But the keys to the temple doors could not be located for a long time. A speech by Nero was read out in the Senate, assailing Vindex. When the words were uttered, The wretch will suffer punishment, and shortly meet his rightful end. All assembled cried out in one voice, You will do it, Augustus! It was also noted that the last piece which Nero performed in public was Oedipus in exile. His finale ended with the verse, Wife, father, mother, drive me to my death. When word came, that other armies had revolted. Nero tore apart the dispatches which were handed to him as he was dining. He tipped over the table, and his two favourite drinking cups were smashed on the ground. These were his Homeric goblets, which were carved with scenes from Homer's poems. Then taking some poison from Lacusta and putting it in a golden box, he went to the civilian gardens. First, he sent his most trustworthy freedmen to the docks at Ostia to get a fleet ready. Then he tried to induce the tribunes and centurions of the Praetorian Guard to accompany him on his escape. Some gave evasive answers, and some openly refused. One of them even cried out, Is it so dreadful, a thing to die? Nero turned over various plans in his mind. Could he go as a supplicant to the Parthians, or Galba, or appear to the people on the rostra. He could dress in black and beg as pathetically as he could for pardon for his past offences. And if he could not soften their hearts, he would entreat them to at least allow him the prefecture of Egypt. After Nero's death, a speech composed for this purpose was found in his writing desk. But it is thought that he did not dare to carry out this plan for fear of being torn to pieces before he could even reach the Forum. Nero delayed any further plans or actions until the following day, but he woke about midnight and found the guards of soldiers had left him. He sprang from his bed and sent for all his friends. No reply came back from anyone. With a few followers he himself went to their rooms. He found that all their doors were closed and no one replied to him so he returned to his own bedchamber. There he discovered that his personal attendants had also fled, taking everything of value with them, including the bed sheets and the box of poison. At once he summoned the gladiator, Spiculus, and anyone else who might be adept at killing. He thought that by this means he might find death, but when no one appeared, he cried out, So then, I have neither a friend nor foe, and ran from the room as if he planned to throw himself into the Tiber. Nero sought a secluded place, 
a location where he could hide and collect his thoughts. His freedman, Feon, offered his villa in the suburbs, between the Via Domitana and the Via Siluria, near the fourth milestone. So Nero left the palace as he was, barefoot and in his tunic. He put on a faded cloak, covered his head, and held a cloth hand towel over his face. Then he mounted a horse, taking with him only four attendants, one of whom was Sporus. But suddenly the earth shook, and a flash of lightning illuminated his face. As they left the palace, they heard the shouts of soldiers from the nearby camp. They foretold destruction for Nero, and the coming success of Galba. Nero heard one of the passers-by say, These men are going after Nero. Another stopped the travellers to ask, Is there anything new in the city about Nero? Then, at a place where a corpse had been thrown out into the road, Nero's horse took fright at the smell. Suddenly his face was revealed. A retired soldier of the Praetorian Guard recognised him and immediately saluted. When they came to a side path leading to the villa, they turned their horses loose. Nero made his way through bushes and brambles, then through a thicket of reeds to the back wall of the villa. This was a difficult route, and a robe had to be thrown down for the barefoot emperor to walk upon. Phaon urged him to hide in a deep pit, which had been dug to excavate sand. But Nero declared that he would not go underground while he was still alive. He waited until a secret entrance could be forced through the wall. Meanwhile, he scooped up some puddle water in his hand to drink, saying, This is my distilled water now. His cloak had been torn and pierced by thorns, so he began to pull the barbs from the fabric. Then he crawled on all fours through a narrow passage that had been dug through the wall. He entered the villa outbuilding and lay down in the first room he came to. It had a couch with a common mattress, over which an old cloak had been thrown. Though suffering from hunger and renewed thirst, Nero refused some coarse bread which was offered to him and drank a little lukewarm water. All his companions urged Nero to save himself as soon as possible from the indignities that threatened him. But he asked them to dig a grave in his presence that was proportioned to his own size and shape. Then he asked them to bring water and firewood. When these tasks had been done, he wept and repeated the phrase, What an artist! The world is losing in me! While Nero hesitated, a letter was brought to Phaon by one of his couriers. Nero snatched it from his hand and read that he had been pronounced an enemy by the Senate. They were seeking him and planned to punish him in the ancient fashion. He asked his companions what sort of punishment this involved. He was told that the condemned person was stripped naked, fastened by the neck to a fork beam, and then beaten to death with rods. In mortal terror, Nero seized two daggers, which he had brought with him. He tested the sharp point of each blade, but he set them down again, insisting that the fatal hour had not yet come. Nero urged Sporus to begin lamenting him, and he pleaded for someone to help him take his own life by setting the example and demonstrating a suicide. Then he reproached himself for his own cowardice, Nero said to himself, To live will bring scandal and shame. This does not suit Nero. It does not suit me. One should be resolute at such times. Come on, instigate the act. He continued with these repetitions until some horsemen were heard approaching the villa. They had orders to seize Nero alive. When he heard them, he shook and quoted the verse. Listen, the sound strikes my ear, the trampling of swift coming pursuers. And he drove a dagger into his own throat. He was aided by Eproditus, his private secretary. He was almost dead when a centurion rushed in 
and pretending that he had come to aid him, pressed a cloak to the wound to stop the bleeding. Nero merely gasped, Too late! And, This is loyalty! With these final words he died. His eyes were so set and staring from their sockets that all who saw him shuddered with horror. Nero died, aged thirty-one, on the anniversary of the murder of Octavia, his first wife. There was public rejoicing at the news. People put on liberty caps and ran about all over the city. Yet there were some who for a long time decorated his tomb with spring and summer flowers. They placed images of Nero on the rostra, dressed in the fringe toga, and displayed his edicts, as if he was still alive and would shortly return and deal destruction to his enemies. Suetonius, Life of Nero, Passages 46 to 57.